is settled, so we'll have more people joining us as we go. Um, but tonight's virtual event is based on an in-person event that should have happened in the store during the time that we were closed, one that I was really looking forward to. Um, so I'm glad that we can uh, have this um, altered digital version to celebrate. Um, we have two wonderful historical fiction authors in conversation this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce them alphabetically, and then I'm not sure if they've decided which order they want to speak in, but then they'll both speak to you a little bit. Um, we can do that alphabetically too, um, which means, Crystal, you'll be first. Um, they'll both speak to you a little bit about their book, uh, their most recent book, and then they will interview each other, and then we'll open it up to questions. So Crystal King is a poet and novelist and the author of two works of historical fiction, Feast of Sorrow, and more recently, the book that she's celebrating this evening, The Chef's Secret. Um, and then our other author this evening is Stephanie Story. She is the author of the critically acclaimed debut, Oil and Marble. And she is here tonight to talk about her new art history thriller, Raphael, Painter in Rome. So welcome, Stephanie and Crystal. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, and Crystal, why don't you go ahead and unmute and tell us a bit about your work. Sure. So um, uh, I'm Crystal and I have two novels, Feast of Sorrow and The Chef's Secret, and they actually run in a, a similar vein. They're both set in Italy. Uh, I am really fascinated with chefs in history or food, uh, food lovers or gastronomes that um, had made their stamp on Italian culture. So my first novel, Feast of Sorrow, is about Apicius, who was the richest man in Italy, lived in first century AD, and he wanted to be gastronomic advisor to Augustus and Tiberius Caesar. And he died in this totally messed up way. So I wrote the story of how he got to that point. And then I thought, well, there's a whole bunch of other people that I could write about in that had um, made their mark in um, Italian food. And one of them was Bartolomeo Scopi, who um, wrote, he actually created this crazy cookbook, which um, is called the Opera of Bartolomeo Scopi. And it has a thousand recipes in it. It was published in 1570. And he was a chef to um, several popes and cardinals. Well, we don't know much about his life. So I got to make all that up. And that's my second book. The Chef's Secret. And we have some crossover there because that's all in the Renaissance. And so some of the things in my book, actually, um, there's a, a particular place that we're going to talk about with Stephanie that um, features in both of our novels, which is kind of fun. All right. So Crystal, you're awesome. Thank you for being here. I was supposed to come up there and be with you guys in person because I have friends, uh, basically family in the area. And then when I got moved to digital, I like emailed Crystal like, please come interview me to talk about Italy. And she was nice enough to come and join me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's my favorite topic. Of course I'm gonna come talk to you. <laughs> right, but still, it's so nice and I so appreciate it. Um, so look, I'm an art, uh, I, I say I'm an art historical novelist. So I write all about art history. So my first book, Oil and Marble, was about the rivalry between Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. And this newest novel, Raphael, is about Raphael's uh, rivalry also with Michelangelo. Only this time, he tells his own story in first person. So right now, I'm going to read you just a few paragraphs from uh, chapter three to give you sort of a sense of who Raphael is and what he's like. Uh, when this chapter starts, uh, he is 21 years old and aspires to be the greatest painter in all of history. And he has shown up in Florence at a moment that you will figure out. Okay, so this is from chapter three. It's just a few paragraphs from chapter three, September 1504, Florence. Thank the blessed Mary that sculptor is not a painter. That's what I thought the first time I saw that giant. Have you seen it? I mean, not copies of it, but the actual thing standing guard outside of City Hall? He's overwhelming, isn't he? Is it his size, his glare, all that gleaming, polished whiteness? I approached quickly, hoping he would shrink upon closer inspection, but he only grew taller. I mean, staring up at him for the first time, I felt how the shepherd boy must have felt 
while facing down his own giant. Fearful, anxious, doubtful, and yet flush with faith that I could somehow find a way to defeat that undefeatable foe. It's ironic that I felt that way, not while staring up at a statue of Goliath, but of David. You know, I'm actually gonna stop there because I wanna talk about this for a moment because here's the thing. I haven't read from chapter three yet. I, th this book came out on April 7th and, and so it's been out for three months and I've been doing readings. I've read the prologue. I've read from other, I've read from the place where Raphael first meets Michelangelo. Oh, it's scary. Michelangelo tries to kill him with a marble hammer. But this moment, the funny thing is it's sort of the reason why I wrote the book. Because here's this 21-year-old aspiring artist who desperately wants to be the greatest artist in the world. And imagine that moment when he walks into Florence for the first time, 21 years old, and has to look up at Michelangelo's freaking David and think, now I have to beat that? That's impossible. It just the, the idea of having to overcome that single statue it is amazing to me, a few years after this, which is where the majority of this plot takes place, Michelangelo and Raphael go head to head in the halls of the Vatican to see which of them is gonna be the greatest painter in history. And with that in the back of his head, oh my gosh, if he's half the painter, he is a sculptor, I am doomed, you know, from looking at the David. That's the feeling, a lot of the feeling of why I wanted to write the story of Raphael and why I wanted him to tell it in his own voice. The other reason why I like doing readings is because there's no way to tell you, yeah, he's telling this story in his own voice. It's an I book, right? But he's really telling you what he really thinks. Uh, one of my favorite descriptions is it's like sitting across a tavern table from him and letting you, him tell you his version of events of what it was like to go up against Michelangelo. So that's my opening rant. I rant a lot. I, I apologize in advance. This is just what happens when I talk about this stuff. Uh, so yeah, I think Crystal and I are gonna have a conversation now. Yeah, and you totally just nixed my whole first question. So that worked out. Um, okay. But, so my first question was really like, I wanted to know why Raphael and why in his voice uh, but you answered that. So my next question is kind of along those lines. It's it, it's kind of sparked from what you were saying. In some of, um, so I met Stephanie when, um, not long after my first novel came out and after Oil and Marble had come out and um, we just happened to luck out and be able to be in the same place at the same time and connect up. And um, so I, I've talked to you a few times since um, as you were writing the book, as you were starting to get going on book two. And um, once I learned what it was about, I remember a conversation that I had with you where you said you weren't so sure about the first person speaking in his voice and that you, you know, that's, that it was felt daunting potentially. Can you talk a little bit about that? I was scared to death of first person. Um, I've been scared to death of first person, I think, since I went to go get my master's in creative writing, yeah. writing at Emerson. They, they, they like beat it into your head that first person's so freaking hard. And I, I, to be honest, I really only like first person books where the narrator is super voicey. I want a really voicey, really opinionated narrator. Otherwise, I'd just personally sort of rather be reading third person, I think. And, and I was afraid I wasn't good enough. Like I thought there's no way I can really sink into a voice and really have a point of view and come at it. Um, come, I, it scared me to death. I just knew how easy it is to do wrong. You say I over and over again, you, you, you just go down, you get too closed in, you can't have enough perspective. Um, it it frightened you can't, me. You can't know things that you haven't seen or witnessed. A and, yeah. Crystal's already also written in first person, by the way, kids. Um, and you, you can't, it's very difficult to explain things that you know back in yeah. the 1500s, but a modern audience doesn't. It's very difficult to like wrap yourself in a pretzel. Yeah, because you wouldn't use a modern word necessarily. The, the character wouldn't use a modern word to describe something they're seeing in speaking but you kind of need to in order to let the audience know. So it's, it, it is tricky. 
Well, and like, and like how, how, how I sort of had to trick myself into getting away to explaining fresco process. Why would a painter explain a fresco process? Um, but I had to, because you at home want to know. You got to like figure it out. Wait. Which you actually did really marvelously, I thought. Um, uh, that was something that I actually remember very well is um, because I've seen so many frescoes. I've stood in front of Raphael's paint in frescoes many times and Michelangelo's and, and, but, and I sort of know what that process was, but being able to read it, I think you really captured that process really well. Thank Definitely. you. Wait, before you move on to your next question, I have to know, did you freak out about writing in first person or were you okay with it? Did you have the same, like I had major like neuroses about it. Like I went into like child's pose. Well, when I was starting to write first Feast of Sorrow, it was maybe, t now it's probably 12 years ago. Yeah. And um, it was, first person was hot. Everybody was writing in first person. I felt like in historical fiction. And I just, I'm, not, I'm kind of a, um, I, I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. So I was not going to write in first person. I just wasn't going to do it. I was a little less concerned about how hard it was and more of that. I just didn't want to be like everybody else. Although you also want to be aware of what the market's going to buy. So there's, now I'm a little bit more mindful of that, but at the time I definitely wasn't. But I, so I rewrote the first um, 15 chapters of that book five times trying to get POV right. And finally, when I switched to first person, it just, it just locked it locked right into place. Well, that was like this. I freaked out about how to tell this story uniquely for Michelangelo. The story's been told over and over and over again, the Sistine ceiling. And finally, when I let, when I gave Raphael the reins and said, fine, he wouldn't shut up. He wouldn't stop talking to me and saying, no, really, let me tell the story. When I finally did it, it worked, but it, it, it was daunting. Okay, sorry. Well, along those lines, so your first novel of, is about um, a rivalry, Michelangelo and da Vinci. And then your second novel is about this is about a, the, a rivalry also with Michelangelo. And so Michelangelo is in the heart of this. I feel I felt like I I've learned so much about Michelangelo from your books in a way that I might not have about da Vinci or Raphael as a result of it. Um, but can you talk about like some of the similarities in those rivalries and some of the differences and how those rivalries shaped art? Well, okay. So, well, first of all, the big similarity is you have the grump that is Michelangelo at the center of them. I mean, he is obnoxious and he is obnoxious in his temperamentalness with his rivals and genuinely trying to do better than them and genuinely, um, hating them if they try to take a look at his work. I mean, he famously is super paranoid and like locks down all of his work. No, you can't look at what I'm doing. Um, and, and he's famously like that with both Leonardo and Raphael. And the other, sim the other major similarity is on the flip side with both Raphael and Leonardo. These were both like the popular kid in class. Both of them were well-loved, charming, sort of courtly type of people who entertained the people they were around with jokes and stories. People loved them. Uh, and I think Michelangelo was somewhat jealous of that and somewhat just despised it. Never would have been it anyway. Um, so I think that's the, that's the biggest similarity. Um, the difference, I'd have to think about the real differences between, because they both Leonardo and, and Raphael are painters. Now, during the, the Michelangelo versus Raphael years, Michelangelo was also painting the Sistine ceiling. So he's also a painter. When he's in co competition with Leonardo in my book, he's carving marble and Raphael's painting the Mona Lisa. Um, the other difference is, I, the main difference to me is Leonardo is 50 years old. He's toward the end of his career. He's already at the pinnacle of his career. When, and Michelangelo is like 25 years old and nobody knows who the freak he is yet. By the time Raphael comes up, Michelangelo has become the old master. He's become the experienced, I'm the person you're chasing. And Raphael is the kid who has to chase him. Um, so that's the difference in their rivalry, what they did for art history. I don't think we would have the major masterpieces of the Italian Renaissance if not for these rivalries. I, I just simply don't think Michelangelo would have pushed himself hard enough to create the masterpieces that he did if he wasn't chasing Leonardo or if he wasn't running from Raphael coming up on his heels. 
And I don't think that, Ra I certainly don't think Raphael would have reached the heights he did if he weren't chasing Michelangelo. He wouldn't have had to. He could have just been perfect and stopped and gone, well, I'm the best because there ain't nobody else. But because there was Michelangelo, it forced him to push his art and therefore all of art history further. I mean, after, so, so Raphael dies at 37 years old, according to Vasari from Too Much Sex. For the next like 400 years, Raphael is the pinnacle of art that people are chasing. And if he hadn't have been chasing Michelangelo, we would have been chasing a shorter pinnacle. The rest of artists would not have been chasing something nearly as high. Um, so I think that's what they did. I think they, by pushing each other, they gave us greater art. They, they made them, they couldn't have done it on their own. I don't think any of us can, right? I mean, don't you feel that way when you read a great book and you go, oh, I want to write yeah. one better. <laughs> don't you? I have a lot of envy for um, a lot of writers, that's for sure. Definitely. <laughs> but does so it, if you it, could be a fly on the wall at any point in Raphael's life, and actually see something, see it, see a scene from his life first person. What would that be? What would you like? What would you personally have liked to have witnessed? Hands down, the moment he walked into the Sistine, when the Sistine was done. So he's in his twenties. He thinks he has created the greatest paintings in all of history. He's put them up on the walls of the Pope's private apartments. He thinks he has a, put up miracles and he has changed art forever. He thinks he has won. And then he has to walk in and see the Sistine ceiling. Now that's not a spoiler alert for my book because we all know what the Sistine ceiling did. We all know what's up on that ceiling. We all know it's a world changing masterpiece. And to be the artist who feels like he's in competition with the artist who painted it and to have to walk in and look at it and go, oh, holy mess. What do I do now? And to be the guy who has such a personality, he doesn't stop, he doesn't give up. He goes on to create some of his greatest masterpieces after seeing the Sistine. So to see it, he must have felt overwhelmed in some fashion. He must have felt devastated by it, but to be able to pick up his sticks and keep playing the game and keep competing and keep pushing is extraordinary. Now, in order for that to work, I would have to be in Raphael's head because I don't think seeing him from the outside like a camera, that moment would have been anything. Right. I, think he, I think he would have right. seen him look up and then turn around and walk out. But, uh, but you, so I would have to be in his head, but hands down, that's one of the reasons why I wrote, wrote the book. I wanted to be in that room, in his head and his heart when he sees that thing. Okay, so I'm gonna have you pick up your book and you're not gonna read from it, but I want you to turn to a page number. And when you get to that page number that I'm gonna give you, um, there's a, I want you to tell me about the scene that is on that page. And that could be from, I mean, give us a sense of what it is. You don't have to read it, um, but tell us what you remember maybe about researching it or writing it, or if there's some historical, something about it that you'd like us to know. Um, and I don't know what page um, this would be because I read it on Kindle, right? So um, I'm gonna have you read page 93 or tell us about page 93. So are you guessing that this is the right page? I have no idea what's on that page. I just- you have no idea. You just picked a random page. Oh, yeah, that's so brilliant. And I wanna know, I want you to just, I want, because this is something you probably would never maybe like talk about in a book, you know, reading, no. so. Hold on, uh, I'm Friday. Oh, oh, okay. So this is, um, this is when, so I have in my novel, uh, Raphael shows up to Rome and he doesn't have any money and he, and he sort of falls upon financial strife. And the reason why I did that in history is if like from the history is because there's this big deal that's made out of when Raphael finally gets paid by the Pope. So I made it, if, if it's a big deal that he finally gets paid, it must have been a big deal that he wasn't getting paid. So I made an assumption that he was probably a little bit broke. Um, <laughs> and plus it makes for good plot, people. It's a novel. 
Okay, so this is the moment when uh, he realizes he's no longer going to be able to live with Bramante in, in the apartments in the Vatican. His, his uh, sort of mentor, uh, Bramante, who was also from Urbino, who is the Pope's uh, architect, comes in and says, you can't stay here anymore. You should have enough money. Did I hire some poor artist, <laughs> some unsuccessful poor kid? No, you should have enough money to be able to go rent your own apartment, go get one. And so he realizes he doesn't have a place to live and he can't admit that he's broke because that would make him look unsuccessful. And he's not gonna do that because he's all about appearances. So he's about to go um, ask Michelangelo if perhaps he can live with Michelangelo, which is a very scary thing to do because Michelangelo is um, a scary guy who is not particularly like Raphael. Um, so what comes up for me in general writing this is I was looking for ways, we all know history tells us that Michelangelo and Raphael are working down from the hall from each other. And if you've been to the Vatican, you realize how sort of close in proximity those two things are, the Sistine and the papal apartment. I feel like you go right from the Raphael rooms into the Sistine almost. You I do. feel like there's no distance between them, but I'm sure there is. There is some, you don't like exit one door and enter the next one. But like, if you look at a little map here, the Raphael rooms, and I mean, it's, it, it's right down the hall. They are very close to each other. I think sometimes when we picture, if you think about this period in history, you put Raphael over here and Michelangelo over here. And that's just not what it looked like. They were bumping up against each other all the time. They had to deal with each other in the hallways. So I was constantly looking for things that they would do when they bumped into each other and ways that they would interact and ways to have their personalities, which were so different, ricochet off of each other um, uh, to, uh, to create that life that goes into a novel. And right. this was one of those things where I thought, well, what would Raphael do if he were stuck? And I'm like, he'd probably go down and ask, hey buddy, can I move in with you? Cause he's asked everybody else on the planet if he can live with them. Michelangelo is like last on the list. But he does go do it, obviously. Um, Don't that, tell him what happens. No, I mean, uh, you, you, oh, okay. Well, I just did, but I didn't really. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so we have some crossover in our book in the sense that our novels both feature a really special building. At least, I know it is to me. I imagine it probably is to you. Um, a very special place in Rome, um, the Summer Palace of Agostino Chigi. And it's now called the Farnesina. It's on the Trastevere side of the river, right across from Campo dei Fiori. And um, it was, uh, and it's funny because I, I always think the, that the, the rich and the wealthy in Rome, they would have their summer palace. It would literally be like within walking distance across the city. And so, but that would be their summer home. And all of them did this. Um, and so this was the summer palace. And my favorite story about the Palazzo is um, Agostino Chigi was a banker um, from, and he was somebody that he was, he was filthy rich. He was absolutely the richest man around by far. And um, to show off his wealth, he had a banquet at, he had kind of a, a water area where people would swim and you would um, have seats that were in the garden. And so he threw this big um, banquet, a feast, and all the dishes were made out of gold and all of the silverware was made out of gold. And to show how wealthy he was and how little the wealth mattered to him, at the end of the meal, he threw it all into the Tiber River. And um, basically um, the guests were just shocked as you might imagine. And, but after the guests left, he took, a, he had his servants pull up the nets with all the, the, the dishes and the silverware, or the, the goldware in it. So that's like my favorite story of the Farnesina. Um, I want to know what your favorite story about the Farnesina is. It's so funny because my I tell them about the Farnesina. Tell them why it's um, important. Well, it, it, it plays an important role in, in, in my story because Kiji was one of Raphael's most important patrons other than the popes, other than the church. And the fresco that is on the front cover of my book is called The Triumph of Galeta. And it is in the Farnesina, the old Kiji Palace. Um, and, and like the identity of this woman plays into the plot and into the real history of Raphael's life. Uh, there's some debate 
about who she is. I made a choice and went with it. Um, so, uh, so the creation of this fresco plays into, um, it plays into the plot. He also, Raphael stays there and just puts some of the most amazing, he just, he sort of decorates ceilings and walls all over the Farnesina. So, um, so if you, if you're interested in Raphael, it really is a place that you cannot miss because some of his greatest masterpieces are on the walls. It's breathtaking. It's my favorite. It's besides the Pantheon, which we're going to talk about, it's my favorite place. Well, and, and Crystal and I have talked about this before. It's, it's such an underrated gem. Like no one goes, you can go to the Farnesina and you're, it's like you and one other dude. Yeah. It's weird. Um, it's, just, it's not even that far off the beaten path. That's the funny thing. I don't know why people aren't as familiar with it, but it is seriously one of the best places in Rome. It should absolutely be like on every top 10 list. And for some reason it's not, and I can't fathom why. Um, so you absolutely have to go when you go to Rome. The, the funny thing is, of course, that story about Kiji throwing all his dishes and then hauling them back out is one of the greatest Kiji stories on the planet. But my actual favorite story about this, about the, the Farnesina, I didn't, could not, for the life of me, fit into the plot of this book. And it made me so mad because it should fit, people. It absolutely should. Because there is, according to legend, one of, there's a section of a wall that is a sort of a black and white head of a boy that, um, it, it's not really black and white, but it's like sepia. And it doesn't seem like it belongs at all. It totally sticks out as like this weird, what the freak is that? And, and you think, why is that there? Legend has it that while Michelangelo was waiting around for Raphael to show up and talk, and Raphael's taking a sweet time, and he's not showing up for a meeting on time, and Michelangelo sort of gets mad and goes up there and just puts this little piece of brilliance on the wall, like, mm, F you for, you know, making me wait. I just took over your wall. I wanted it in the story so badly because it is about their rivalry, right? right? Well, it but is. also the legend has it that Raphael thought it was so, he couldn't possibly paint over it, right? That, that's right. So that's why it's still there. So he shows back up and he's like, well, I'm going to leave it. Um, which, which was something that Raphael does regularly in his life. If there's a great piece of art, even if um, it's going to hurt him, he leaves it. Like he sort of won't destroy great art. He's known for that. Um, and this is one of those examples. I wanted to include it so badly. I like, I worked for months. I would take stuff apart and it just never, I couldn't ever get Michelangelo to the Farnesina in a way that made sense. I couldn't get him out of the Sistine. Now it's a total legend, who knows if it's true, right? Like a lot of Michelangelo scholars say that's not a Michelangelo. Um, is it, I, but I couldn't make it happen. And I was dying to, but every time I did, it ended up adding like an extra 50 pages to the book. And I was like, I can't do it. So I had to kill off one of my favorite things about that building. Aww. Okay, well, let's talk about one of my other favorite buildings, which is the Pantheon. And that is where Raphael is buried. And so um, I wanna know what it was like the first time that you saw his tomb. Like what was, and, and to be buried in such an incredible, incredible place. That is pretty remarkable for somebody who's so young. That speaks to how much people in Rome thought about him and, and really genuinely loved his art and loved him that he ends up being buried in the Pantheon. Um, the first is so funny because the first time I saw it, so I go to get my art history degree at Vanderbilt and there's a, there's a semester where you can go study art and Italian at the University of Pisa. So of course I sign up and go, please, please, please. And so I go over there for a semester and it's my first time in Italy. I had, I had traveled through Europe when I was 18 with a choir performing all over Europe, but we hadn't gone to Italy. Um, and so it's my first time in Italy when I go live over there for a semester. And we went like, I think the third week down to Rome and it's my first time in Rome. I'm like lost and we were like wandering around. We don't really know what anything is. And, but of course we make it to the Pantheon because everybody goes to the Pantheon yeah. and it's right all in the, the middle. All roads lead there, I think. Right, and it's right in the middle of everything. Like you're right in the heart of, 
you know, yeah, like, like you said, all roads lead there. Like you end up, and you end up walking through that square multiple times. And when we went in and I'm walking around the side, that's how I found out Raphael was buried in the Pantheon because prior to that moment, I didn't know it. I had no idea he was there. And I'm sitting there looking at it going, are you serious? I, I didn't know until I happened to be in the Pantheon for the first time and I, and I was standing in front of it. I was just like, what? And my husband is an art is uh, an artist, and I don't think he knew at the time either. So it was, it it's something that a lot of people don't realize. I think. Well, and it's so funny because now I feel like we only know you know the main way that Raphael the name rings bells in our heads. It's he's a teenage mutant ninja turtle, and back then he was oh, famous true. enough to be buried in the pan. I mean, really, I, I I hate to say it, but when I talk to when because I've skyped into some classes, some like high school classes. Um, oh, yeah. and I taught, at, the turtles. <laughs> I taught it a couple before this and they're, they're, it's always the joke with Michelangelo and Leonardo they're just turtles but with Raphael it's genuine like wait he's not just a turtle I didn't know that oh. <laughs> now wait but I have to ask you so other than the Farnesina so the Pantheon is your favorite place in Rome because you've written so much about Rome you've written about ancient Rome and Renaissance Rome. Lots of Renaissance Rome. And my third novel is also set in Renaissance Rome, so which I'm working on now. Um, oh, really? You're going back to the Renaissance? It's very exciting. Yeah, and I'm also going to Urbino. I spent some time in Urbino, which is where Raphael was born. And I got, uh, two years ago, I was there and I was able to see where he lived. And, um, and it's, which is, it, which is nuts to think that that's still a lot, that's okay. still there. And that a lot of the things in the, place where he was is actually um was from that time frame and from when he lived there um it's really well preserved um and urbino is the wildest town it's it. it's all brick everything and it's on these it's on a hillside and there's no it's no easy way to get there and um i can't imagine what it would be like in the winter time um because it, this the hills are like this and there's like a valley in the center of the, the city where the Palazzo, the, the Ducale, the Palazzo Ducale, which is this monstrous castle is. And then the Chiesa is there, but then these crazy high streets. I was just, I can't, I actually can't stop thinking about Urbino. I think it's just the most uh, charming, amazing little place I've ever been. It's, I don't know if you felt that way, but I was just blown away by it. I'm blown away by it because like Raphael, in a way, it gets left, I mean, not that Raphael gets left off of lists, right? He's one of the tri the rena great Renaissance triumvirate, but these days he sort of does. And and Urbino, I feel like gets left off of people's- And that know, Palazzo has one of the best Renaissance art museums in the entire world. It does. It's, it's an amazing place. And you're right, part of the problem probably is it's really hard to get to. Yep. For those of you who don't know, you're either gonna absolutely have to rent a car or you got to take like three trains and two buses. Yeah, like, or yeah, no, or hire a driver. Yeah, or or, or hire a driver. Um, so you really have to go out of your way to get to Urbino, but it is an amazingly preserved, really high Renaissance town to me. I mean, it it's got a lot of medieval the seat of the Renaissance more so than Florence at a lot of that during that time frame in some ways. In Which some ways, the court was, yeah. so, so Raphael is, is raised, his dad is like the court painter and poet in Urbino. So he's raised as the kid of a courtier um, in this amazing court that really is, uh, has so much influence over the entire peninsula, even though it's this tiny little weird hill, hill town. But yeah. Anyway. It's, yeah, if you, if you ever um, want a really unique, wonderful place to go, but you only need like maybe maybe two days but you can probably see everything in one day it's really tiny you could walk across the whole city in probably 40 minutes max yes and that's because the hills are really steep <laughs> i don't know what this what were you going to ask me though because that that might not have been the answer i have no idea what I, I was probably in the middle of a question and then i asked it and then we started talking about arbino and that's where my head went but now okay. that you've said it i am going to ask you a question because you're the food writer about the Italian Renaissance, but we're talking about Italy and we're talking about trips to Italy. And I think everybody here is probably dying to go back at some point because we can't go right now and it's heartbreaking and we all want to go, which is why we have to read books about it so we can mentally travel there. But forget about the history for a minute. What's been your favorite meal you've eaten in Italy ever? Oh gosh. There are lots, I'm sure you only get so to pick one. 
Um, and some of them have been very expensive, but the best meals I think are the least expensive. I think one of them that was the most memorable is, um, so my third novel is partially set in Bormarzo and Caparola, which is, um, they're two small towns north of Rome. Bormarzo, Bormarzo is a where it's a stone monster park. Do a search for in Google for Italian monster park and it is incredible. And so part of my novel is set there and these big crazy stone monster sculptures. And then Caparola is where um, Alessandro Farnese, who is the richest cardinal in, um, um, he was the patron for Michelangelo, for Vasari, for um, Julio Clovio, who's considered the miniaturist. Um, he was like the Michelangelo of miniature painting um, and for Al Greco and all sorts of other pa um, painters. I don't think he ever had Raphael. He was too young at the time. Um, but he said before he really yeah I think so and um, but he his father and and the and when his father was Pope Paul III mm -hmm. the Cardinals probably definitely his father and his grandfather probably knew who he was mm -hmm. but Caparola is um, a pentagonal palazzo um, it has a pentagonal palazzo at the, at the top of the hill and Alessandro Farnese owned a, a palazzo there and that building is what um, the Pentagon in the United States is modeled after it's this mm -hmm. Pentagon um, shaped building with a courtyard in the center and uh, down the hill from there there's I cannot remember the name of the restaurant I could find it if anyone wanted to reach out to me um, through my website crystalking.com and just ask me I could find the name for you but we had um, a uh, it was like uh, a ravioli stuffed with goose and um, in this like plum sauce I think that was incredible incredible, absolutely mind blowing. But we, and when we had um, some smoked duck um, for like smoked duck, um, it was like slices of smoked duck was the, the appetizer, the aperitivo. And it was just heavenly. And it was in the hole in the wall. We were the only tourists in the whole place. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So I remember that there's lots of great meals though. Um, and yeah, uh, lots and lots of them. This I, I is my, about this is why you can't read Crystal's books while hungry because she talks about Renaissance food all the time. And you're always like, Oh my gosh, I just want to eat all of the things. Maybe not all the things, but lots of the things. <laughs> That's true. Now wait, Michelangelo features in, uh, your book in the, the ships. my second and my third. Oh, he, he's back in the third. Yeah. He, it, one, can, can I Another tell people that what, what he is in the second one, that he's a sh So in the second one, he is painting the altar of the Sistine Chapel. And um, Bartolomeo Scopi, the chef that I'm writing about, um, would have been a chef for the popes at that time. And he is creating a meal for um, Charles V, the emperor. And um, actually he was in, in um, he worked for a cardinal at the time, um, Cardinal, um, um, De Carpi, and he needed to create a, an incredible meal for this emperor. And so he was, and the sugar sculptures at these meals were extraordinarily elaborate. And you created sugar sculptures usually using a mold. Um, and the molds were very similar to the way that you might cast bronze, except you were doing it with hot sugar. And so I, and I know that Scopi probably knew of Michelangelo, maybe even fed him once in a while. And so I thought, you know, Michelangelo worked in bronze. This was about the same time there was these sculptures of these bronze, um, uh, like, um, were they like le leopards or like not leopards, but um, jaguars or something oh, yes. that were discovered and they, and they were identified as definitely Michelangelo. And so I actually have one of my characters owning those sculptures and she convinces my, um, my, the chef well, he definitely can do bronze because he thought, no, he's a painter. He's not going to do this. So he convinces Michelangelo to help him make sculptures for Charles V. So I love it that Michelangelo is a sugar sculptor in the middle of Crystal's book. He, he, he carves a snowman in oil and marble, a, 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 an ice sculpture, which I derogatorily call a snowman. Um, uh, so he's, he, he's not only a bronze sculptor and a marble sculptor and a painter and an architect, he's also a sugar sculptor and an ice sculptor. I don't know if he really did that, but I thought he could. No, I love it. I think it's brilliant. He could have done it, yeah. 
in my third novel, I he so Michelangelo is also a, a big friend of um, Vittoria Colonna, mm -hmm. and um, she was um, a woman that they just became very dear friends, and they wrote each other all the time. Um, Michelangelo, um, one of his greatest regrets when um, she died was that he never kissed her. And Michelangelo is famously known as being probably gay. All, he's got very more erotic poetry that he's left behind. And, um, but he, and he also said that she was the soul of a man in a woman's body. So, um, or that she, like, basically she should have been born a man because I think maybe she was very intellectually his, his equal and um, he had just this great love for Vittoria Colonna. And so I use that to my advantage also to get him to do something for one of my characters. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, so I, I started writing art historical fiction because in part because, I, because of my problematic obsession with Michelangelo. Uh, so I read everything under the sun that mentions his name. Not that I don't read Crystal's books anyway, but now I'm like, come on, get it done, Crystal, so I can read about Michelangelo in your new book. No, oh, it's not a big scene, but it's I fun. don't care. It can be two fun. sentences. I don't it's care. super fun. I also get to write about Vasari in that one, too. And um, there's another great Michelangelo story with Vasari. So um, the Palazzo Cancelleria, which is right near Palazzo, um, it's right in um, right next to Palazzo Farnese and the Campo dei Fiori. If, if you've been to Rome in the Campo dei Fiori, you probably walk by the Cancelleria all the time. There's actually a Da Vinci exhibit of like his, his machines that's in there. And um, that is where Alessandro Farnese lived. Um, and so he um, um, had it painted by Vasari. There's this room, um, which you cannot see. I have tried every way under the sun to get myself in there, but it's owned by the Vatican. It's not available to the public. And so finding getting in there has been really difficult. Um, but there's this room and it's called the Room of 100 Days, um, the Sala di Centi, Centi Giorni. And um, rumor has it that Vasari was puttering around. He was taking his dear sweet time creating this room, these rooms. And it took him, and so finally um, Farnese said, you know, get this done, you better hurry up. So Vasari like put everything aside and he just, and, cause he had a deadline and he was, and the only way he's gonna meet is if he really started doing it. So he painted the whole room in a hundred days. And rumor has it that nobody was happy about it. Um, and it's a strange room. It's a, I've seen the, what the paintings look like and the design of the room and the way the paintings are very odd. And um, so rumor has it Michelangelo was there for some reason. Um, he did do some work for Farnese, but nothing um, overly spectacular. And um, he, um, he was doing work on the, the Farnese, um, his grandfather's Palazzo, which is next door. So that's probably why he was there. So he saw the, um, the Room of the Hundred Days. And um, when he was told that it was done in a hundred days, somebody told him, you know, you know Vasari did this in just a hundred days. He looked around the room and he's like, yeah, it looks like it. Right. <laughs> so yeah. just, Michelangelo didn't do anything in a hundred days. Michelangelo no. was obsessed and deep dive and he took everything. I mean, maybe he polished the Pieta in a hundred days. Maybe he added, you know, <laughs> Maybe he, but he accomplished so much for being a slow worker, which is the crazy thing. Well, I, he was so, he was so obsessive. He did so much. I, everywhere I turn, um, um, in fact, that scene with Vittoria that I'm going to use Vittoria Colonna. What I'm having them do, I discovered that he architected a chapel in um, uh, the Chiesa of. Um, uh, Maria Maggiore on it's the huge it's a huge basilica on the top of the hill above the Monte and um, he was the architect on it he probably didn't work on it but like there's just lots of little tiny things that he no, did he, all over Rome he, he over did Rome. he he there he, there are designs in his hand uh, for that chapel so he did work on it I mean he's that's but that's who he was he he created a, an enormous amount of architecture late in his life but look if you're completely obsessive and you're doing it every single day and you're working so hard that you're not bothering to change your clothes or shower or eat and you're, you're working so long that you forget to change your boots so long that when you finally do your skin comes off with your socks and you're working and you're working and you're still carving marble one week before you die at eight, almost 89 years old, you got a lot of time yeah. to get a lot of stuff done. He didn't sit sure. around watching. Well, you know what? We're running out of time. So we should let people ask questions, right? 
Uh, I was I actually it was going to be just, like, come on, guys. <laughs> we're going to like just jump looking in. for a good opportunity like, to jump in um, and remind the audience that you can ask a question in the chat um, if you have any questions or if you want to ask a question on camera, just a reminder that we are taping, so you will be part of the recording if you unmute and talk. But if you want to be ask a question on camera, you can wave and let me know or let me know or let Davis know in the chat if you'd like to do that. Um, and while people are typing in their questions, if anyone has them, um, I would love to ask you both a little bit, we were talking beforehand, and I think the audience would be very interested in how the pandemic has influenced your research and how you're creatively working around some of the hindrances to research that are happening right now. Um, I'm doing virtual tours of Italy. There's um, actually context travel and through eternity. You can um, sign up, they're really inexpensive. I'm, I was supposed to go to Naples this fall and that will be canceled. And so I've not been to Napoli yet. So I'm actually going to do a tour um, with uh, a guide. And I don't know if it's actually walking around, but at least I'll get history, um, historical um, context for a lot of the things that I can find online that I can speak with a historian about. So I'm doing that kind of thing. Um, but not being able to go is such a bummer. Um, I don't know about you, Stephanie. I, you're, are you working on the next thing yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, I had I had the first draft done prior to the pandemic. Um, I, I've been using so much of this time to read. Uh, now, my next book leaves the Italian Renaissance. Um, not that I won't be back. I will. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still writing art historical fiction. I hope to be writing art historical fiction until the day I freaking keel over like Michelangelo with the carving until 89, that's gonna be me. Um, but I'm leaving uh, the Italian Renaissance for now, we'll be back. Um, so the one hint I will give you, because I'm answering this question, I've not been giving this strong of a hint, but I am reading an extraordinary number of French newspapers that it turns out are archived online back for about 150 years. You can find real French, and you can find the actual copies of them. So you can see the photocopies of them and then you can zoom in. And I took uh, eons of French. So I am surprised and happy that I can still read it without having to oh, Google translate awesome. much. Like every it's once in a while. what you can print. find online now too. Like 10 years I, ago, nothing like that would have been found online. And I have to say, if it weren't for the pandemic, I probably would not have found it online because I would not have been desperate enough to find French resources because I would have just gone to a library. I would have gone to an external source to go try to find the information. Uh, that has been taken away. And so I got a little bit more creative in my search for real French sources from the time. And it landed me on this website where I'm going through and I'm reading you know, I'm finding stuff that nobody's ever translated into English. Um, you know, facts that 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 I've never seen put in a bio of other people because they're just still in the original French newspapers. They, and it's too obscure for anybody to have bothered to write about. But I'm going to use it for a novel because that's what we do as art historians is we use obscure, weird, you know, historical fiction writers. That's what we do. We find the weird footnote and then we turn it into a whole book because that's what we do. Um, I do have to comment on this one comment from Linda who comments on the narrator for Raphael. Um, I, I have to give a shout out to PJ Auckland who is fabulous. He read both Oil and Marble and, and Raphael but his reading of Raphael is amazing. He just won a Near Phones Award for it. Uh, which I was pleased with because it means they also like the book. But mainly, I, PJ, and I was freaked out about listening to this one because as you heard from my reading, I have a voice in my head. It's and so it, weird when you hear someone else's voice reading your stuff. It's so weird. Yeah. I don't like it, but I actually liked this one. So I will also give a shout out for the audiobook version, particularly since I hear, I don't picture Raphael. Raphael didn't write the story down. You are not reading a story that has been written down. You are reading the story as though he is speaking to you. And so the audiobook for me uh, is, is fun and exciting. Not that they're not always, but it is weird to hear your words read by other people, right? Crystal, do you do it? Do you listen to other people? Do you listen the to- The narrator for Feast, I really, um, 
it was, it was amazing, Simon Vance, and he's award-winning. He's, I think he's done like 100 audio books or something crazy like that. And he's incredible, but he voices all the characters. And I was driving in my car and I'm listening to it. And it's, it's like, I didn't write the book. It's like somebody else wrote it. It's, I know the whole story, but I'm like, did I write that? It's the weirdest feeling. But then he, um, one of the characters is this big Egyptian slave, this beefcake, like huge monster man. And he has this voice for it. And I just burst out laughing because it was just not the voice I had. And it was a voice that worked for him. And I, and it grew on me very quickly, but I was, I'm sure whoever was watching me at the intersection thought I was insane, but it was fun. Yeah, li listening to your own audiobook is um, is a That's peculiar, true. weird thing about being an author uh, in in this day and age that we get to do that. It's, it's a gift and a curse at the same time. <laughs> I've got a question um, for Crystal. Um, Back years and years ago, I did a little Latin, uh, studied for a bit, and one of the, the things that I most enjoyed was uh, reading about um, cuisine. So the famous uh, Saint Etrimalchionis yes. and the Satyricon, uh, it's, it just it drives me crazy all the time. Um, and there, there were those wonderful, that wonderful cookbook that exists. What kind of, um, uh, I had, had a book on the shelf, The, the Way the Latin Zip, yes, yes. Uh, exactly, um, with all the garum and stuff. What other kinds of, what, what kind of resources are there for the Renaissance? And if you want to tell us a little bit about that stuff, I, I think it's interesting. I think other people might too. I actually have um, on my website, crystalking.com, I have two pages, one for ancient Roman cuisine and, ancient, and one for Renaissance. And it, it is like, kind of encapsulates a lot of the history in, in one place. And then there's also resources of recipes. I have two cookbooks um, for each era. Uh, or a cookbook for each era where I work with area chefs and I work with um, food historians and culinary experts to recreate the recipes and you can download those for free on my website too. And, um, but I, I loved going through these recipes, especially the ancient, scoby is easy. Scoby, you can pick it up and you can, you if you're an okay person in the kitchen, you can probably figure out a lot of it. And it's where we have pies and, the, and turkey recipes. It's the first turkey recipes ever printed in anywhere um, is in the scoby book. There's um, recipes for just simple things that we're familiar with. Um, as the garum that you mentioned, that's fish sauce. And that's what they cooked everything in in ancient Rome. And that is weird for me because I don't like fish. And so recreating the recipes was tricky, but it turns out that they used it instead of salt. And so it lent, if you use it sparingly, it lends an umami flavoring to things. And now some of my favorite dishes are made with garum or um, actually a Vietnamese or Thai fish sauce. It's the same thing. Or um, you can buy colatura, which is an Italian um, fish sauce. You can buy, get that on Amazon or at specialty shops. But um, there's lots and lots of resources for both um, ancient Rome and for Renaissance Rome um, or Italy in general on, on my site. All right, I, I haven't seen another question. I am gonna jump in real fast because Crystal's been so much better than I am about just telling you about her website. I, I'm terrible. Yes, you have to know about hers. <laughs> I'm terrible about it, but, it, but as long as she said it, I'm, it's going to remind me to say, if you go to stephaniestory.com and you are reading the book, so if you're reading, if you're reading the physical book, right, you'll come across a painting and you would have to go to Google or something. If, you don't have to. You can go to my website, stephaniestory.com, and at the top, there's this little banner that you can click on. And I've built a page that lets you follow along with all the artwork and all the images as it comes up in the book. So that when I mention a certain painting or I mention a specific drawing that really happened in history or whatever, you can find it there and you can see a picture of it um, and then find out more about it by following links and stuff. But it's really just there, not with words. You're not going to get distracted from the story with like big, long descriptions or anything. It's just going to be the picture. So you can look at what I'm talking about if you are interested while you are reading. Crystal, you're so good about that stuff. I'm so bad. I need to take a lesson from you. Uh, well, I do that in my day job because, you know, um, <laughs> being an author is not always lucrative. So um, unless you're lucky. So I'm, I actually work in marketing um, full time and teaching social media. So um, I love that. I love that stuff. I can talk about that stuff forever, too. So it's yeah, if, if it works well in my author life. 
I always say that it's a completely separate job from writing a good book and that there should be classes for authors on marketing because oh it yeah is. definitely I Just sometimes because you've written a good book authors yeah well good I will tell people about that when they ask and we are very close to out of time um, unless people have other questions they want to put in the chat or ask on camera um, I wondered if either of you would like to um, give a last little wrap-up question to the other I want to know what no book pressure. you're reading right now Stephanie what what a book you're reading or a book you really love that you've read recently oh gosh i've read like eight so like there are bunches flitting through my head um oh and now i'm just gonna now i'm trying to think of like the great one to say that's the problem it's all kinds of pressure as though i'm supposed to come up with this um a brilliant thing it, okay, so I just read one and it was for a blurb, so it's not out yet, but I'm going to have to say it because it's the one that won't leave my brain. And it's by Laura Morelli and it's called The Night Portrait. And it's I just about, read it too. It's so good and it's, it's really so brilliant. Aged to me, and I am, I was so into it. It has Da Vinci in it. It has Leonardo Da Vinci in it. So it, it, it's centered around one of his most famous paintings, The Lady of the Ermine, and it's got two different storylines. It's got sort of the old one with Leonardo and the sit and the sitter of that painting, the model for that painting. And it's also got a World War II storyline uh, where that where that painting is being rehunted by ba basically the Monuments Men. There, there, there's a couple different uh, World War II timelines. There's four people. He has a book that just came out too, which is also about Michelangelo that's called The Giant. The Giant yes. Which is a very different take on Michelangelo. So if you want to keep reading about Michelangelo, um, her book, The Giant, is good too. Yeah, it, it, it's about the creation of David. Wait, but I'd ask you, but you're not allowed to pick Laura Morelli now. So somebody different. <laughs> what book are you reading? Oh, what book am I reading? I read so much too. Um, I read a lot of books. Um, I'm trying to think, what have I read recently? Are you um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, Lo, um, on the Italy vein, um, Alyssa um, Palombo, she has a book called The Borgia Confessions, really which um, it's probably not the most recent book I read, but it's the first one that came to mind. And she has a really different take on Cesare Borgia. Um, he's um, not, he's still kind of a jerk, um, but not quite in the same way. Like it's, it's, I think it's really interesting when people write about really villainous people and you still sort of want to read about them. So she does a really good job doing that. So oh, that was another book that came to mind. Borgia is, Cesare Borgia is a horrible, villainous, awful human being. He's yeah. in My Oil of Marble. He doesn't come across it because I don't spend that much time on him. But man, she actually, I can't believe I wanted to read about him. Like I wanted to get into his head. It was like, it, I could have killed her for it just because I'm like, no, I shouldn't want I'm like, to I don't want to like this guy, but I was like rooting for him. And that's like, oh yeah. You just feel kind of dirty afterwards. You're like, no, I shouldn't like him like that. Cause he's horrible. He's actually, a, he was a horrible human being very definitely. Yep. <laughs> she was a masterful job with that. <laughs> Um, Crystal, I love your books and I so appreciate you joining me just as a personal thank you because I love your books oh. and, and, and I, I love hanging out with you and talking. I don't know if you guys can notice, but like we could talk about Italy and books and art and food forever. Like it's, yeah. I just so always, always ask Crystal food questions because her books always make me hungry and I love them so much. And so, and, and, and I just gave, I just handed Crystal's book off to my sister-in-law. She's a book club in, in Oklahoma. I'm going to have her call you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank so guys, you. we are just about out of time. This was a fantastic evening. Thank you so much both for being here and you're right. I'm very hungry now. I don't know what my husband is cooking, but I am looking forward to whatever it is. So thank you for giving me an appetite. Um, thank you both for being here and for sharing your wonderful books. Um, thank you to our audience for being here this evening. It was a treat to see you all. Um, our next Northshire Live event will be on Monday. Um, that is a very special ticketed event with Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue, um, the great uh, Hollywood power couple. I myself was raised on Free to Be You and Me by Marlo Thomas, so I'm, that's my entryway in there. They've written a wonderful book on um, longevity of marriages, and they will be interviewed by Joe Donahue, no relation of WAMC Northeast Radio. 
and you can find the tickets for that on Eventbrite. And so hopefully we'll see you all again next Monday. Um, thanks everyone for being here and take care. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.